our last panelist is Professor Guru Prashad Kaur. He is now in Indian Statistical Institute, professor since 2012. His research area is basically foundation of quantum mechanics. Professor Kaur. First, let me thank uh, Breakthrough Science Society for organizing such important conference and, and such big scale and giving me a chance to speak here. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, since two, uh, yesterday we are discussing about superstitions, about propaganda, anti-science, and so so. Uh, <coughs> and why are we discussing all these things with such importance? Because we are worried about these propaganda, anti-science. Uh, we are worried because this is not the, just the handiwork of some fringe groups who are where, what you can see anywhere in the world who are propagating all these uh, anti-sciences. <coughs> Actually, the thing is more serious. Sometimes we don't tell it explicitly, but it is in our mind. Actually, Indian state as we see, irrespective of who, who is in power, seems to have taken a policy, not announced policy, but it is their policy to uphold such misinformation campaign. <clears throat> now one can ask why. <clears throat> Possibly, the answer may be like this. After the implementation of neoliberal economy, the condition of the farmers, working people, Dalit and tribes, have been deteriorating at a faster rate, where corporate capital along with a group of high middle class have amassed huge wealth and you can see so many information regarding that 1% of the Indian holds this much wealth. This kind of statistics are available. So now let us have a look at some of these forms of development and condition of the various section of the working people. Then we can understand why Indian state, irrespective of who is in power, are so eager to uphold this kind of misinformation campaign regarding science. Let us see some crude facts. So you can see that calories intake is decreasing. You can see 1993 to 1994, then 2004 to 2005, and 2009 to 10. You can see that calories intake are decreasing, protein intake is also decreasing. We can think that the people that we are present here, uh, maybe that this calorie and protein intake are not decreasing. It may be to some extent increasing also. But then some bigger section of the masses, for the bigger section of the masses, actually it is decreasing so fast that on the average it is decreasing. Now, sometimes it is told that India is going forward with this huge development and all this thing, but if you look at the share of the workforce in various sectors like agriculture, manufacturing, and service. You can see for agriculture, still a large section of the workers are involved in agriculture, though it has decreased to some extent, but still it is very high. But manufacturing, manufacturing, it has hardly increased, though there is big propaganda regarding the development of uh, manufacturing in industry, you can see the number of workforce, share of workforce still is very low. And service sector, service sector is growing. Actually, in an economy where even the minimum needs, minimum needs of the vast masses are not met, this dominance of the service sector amounts to a form of parasitism. That's why you see this promoting business along with hotel and tourism. There is so much encouragement for hotel and tourism. 
So we know that more than three lakhs of farmers have committed suicide in the last 20 years. It's, it's actually, actual statistics will be much higher. Why? You can see that for, for farmers who have lands between one to two hectares, they are still in distress. Their total consumption exceeds their income. So they are in permanent debt. And these debt-ridden farmers are committing suicide in India every day. And this has been calculated from a National Sur Sample Survey report. And you can get it from a journal called uh, Aspects of Indian Economy. It is a free journal. You can access it in the uh, internet. And for the dismal picture for organized sector, you can see manufacturing, there is 12% share of workforce. But in the organized sector, <coughs> Organized sector employs on less than 2% of the workforce. So even in manufacturing, most of the people are employed in unorganized sector. Now, if you look at the pattern of the bank credit, you see that bank credit for agriculture has decreased, and still it is decreasing. 1990, it was 15.9%. In 2006, it is 11.4%. And it has not increased. I hope that it has not increased in these uh, last few years. <coughs> Small scale industry, which employs more than 10% uh, workers, they are, it has gone abysmally low. 11 from, in 1990, it was 11.5, now it is, in 2006, it is 6.5, and I also think that it has not uh, changed much. But if you look at the housing loan, I, I was telling you that a parasite kind of economy has developed. Housing, if you look at, it has gone up by 10% almost from 2.4 in 1990 to 12.0 in 2006. And it has been increasing uh, till now. And this retail loan, consumption loan, <coughs> that has also increased. So what you see that preference for loan is not given to production. Production is not encouraged, but consumption is encouraged. And I have not uh, taken the statistics what amount of bank loan has gone to the big capitalists, but you know that most of the bad debt has been there because of their, they have not uh, paid that uh, loan. <clears throat> and also there is a surprising uh, statistics that Outstanding credit for the purchase of cars and two-wheelers has risen from rupees 460.2 billion in 2002 and 2003 to 1.0 trillion in 2007-67. And not only that, 89% of the new cars sold in 2006 to 2007 were brought with credit. So it is not reflecting the natural purchasing power of the people, but there is some initiative from the government itself <coughs> to provide loans to the car purchasers. <coughs> and not only that, this 79% uh, of the value of the purchase uh, uh, is due to, is by loans only. And there is one more important point, the economy that is being run by the present government for some years, <clears throat> you can call it accumulation by disposition. <clears throat> you know what is happening in central India. If you look at Chhattisgarh, 
In Chhattisgarh, 16 percent of India's coals are available, 10 percent of the country's iron ore, this is very good iron ore, <coughs> 5 percent of the limestone, 5 percent of the bauxite, 88 percent of the tree of tin, but 40.5 percent people there are below poverty line. And you know that in Chhattisgarh, a large section of tribal people are there. <coughs> In Jharkhand, it is also a mineral-rich uh, state. 29% of India's coals we get from there. 14% of the country's iron ores. <coughs> and 35% of the district's area is covered with forest, which is uh, a great uh, and a natural uh, resource. <coughs> there, 44%, again, mostly tribal, people are below poverty line. Similarly, if you look at Odisha, where also uh, there are large section of tribal people, in Kevanjar, if you look at the most mine district of the state, 62 percent of the population lives below the poverty line. In Koraput, the bauxite capital of India, the figure is higher at 79 percent. And if you go to Sundargarh, Sundargarh performs a little better than 37% of its population under poverty line. And <clears throat> the title I have taken from an article, The Biggest Grab of Tribal Lands After Columbus. <clears throat> so in the period of globalization, maybe for during last 25, 30 years, 7.9 million hectares have been, have, uh, sector have over the years been acquired under the Colonial Act of Land Acquisition, which, is, which was designed in 1894 during colonial rule. And the number of displaced people is around 10 million. The claim that mining and mineral-based industries would create more uh, employment but actually, if you look at the statistics, the employment has gone down even in these sectors. And if you look at this scenario since 1947, then actually approximately three crore people were displaced for setting up power plants, irrigation projects, mining companies, steel industries, and many more development projects in the country. Among them, 40% displaced people are tribal and 20% are lowlids, <clears throat> which means the 60% displaced people are from the marginalized communities. Now look at the caste operation which is being discussed here by some speakers. I have taken a, a statistics which is by National Crime Bureau, Records Bureau and it has been mentioned also in uh, a book uh, named Annihilation of Caste by Ambedkar, where the foreword was written by Aurundhuti Rai. From there I have taken this thing, that a crime is committed against a Dolit every 16 minutes. Every day, more than four untouchable women are raped. Every week, 13 Dolits are murdered and six Dolits are kidnapped. In 2012 alone, where there are big uproar in Delhi gang rape, uh, and murder case. In the same year, uh, 1,574 Dolis women were raped and 651 Dolis were murdered. And if you look at the illicit capital flight from India because of, uh, because of aggression by monopoly finance capital, but this is illicit capital flight. Actual cap capital flight happens in so many ways and that will that may be 20% of our GDP. But here you can see it is this illicit capital flight is increasing uh, every year. And around and in 2012 it is around 5.2% of the GDP. So what we see the policies that are uh, maintained <coughs> Continuous a systematic reliance on import technology. So that means actually our government don't encourage uh, 
development of indigenous uh, technology by using the potential of our uh, scientists and science students. Export of cheap skill labor in IT. So we are, we have been seeing boom in IT sector, but that is nothing but the export of cheap skill labor. The skill labor which if we could use in a constructive way for the development of our country, we would have been rich, but actually we are selling our cheap labor and exporting it to uh, developed countries. And actually we are gear gearing towards an elite consumption pattern for a few that just I told. And government, has, government is taking all the policies which favors for privatization of education and wealth and health. So the anti-scientific belief that we have been discussing for the last two days, uh, in particular in India, it originated uh, in, in the last part of the Bengal Renesha. Uh, at that time, a section of educated middle class while serving the British rule accepted this kind of uh, belief as a national prize based on Hindu religion. But present disparate attitude that we see in our country suggests that it is not merely the handiwork of some fringe groups. Had it been the just handiwork of some, some fringe group, maybe we would not have taken so much initiative to oppose it. So it is my contention that as the economy of globalization have been creating massive poverty and misery for the people, various anti-scientific propaganda along with various superstition are being encouraged by the state in some or other way. Why? To dupe the people, to divide the people, to crush any resistance that may arise. So in my conclusion, I want to tell that scientists while fighting against this anti-science propaganda and this superstition that, it, that are being encouraged, but at the same time, we cannot be, we cannot remain indifferent to the broad economy. We may not be economists, we may not know tidbits of economics, but we cannot be indifferent to the broad economic policies that cannot generate a decent economy that improves people's lives, proper scientific education, proper health, protection to environment, improvement of the condition of marginalized people. So in sum, I want to tell that when we are going to oppose this anti-science propaganda, then we should also show the correlation between the policies that government is taking and their urge to uphold this misinformation campaign regarding science. Thank you all.